Welcome everyone. My name is Mobolaji Olori Shade. I work um, at Kauri Wise and we're so delighted to have you here. Our speakers will soon join us, but before then, let me just give like a quick reason why we're doing why we're doing this, right? So um, I'm sure most of us know that March generally or internationally is Women's Month, even though March 8th is Women's Day. The whole of March is actually, you know, um, used to celebrate women um, worldwide. So we thought that this month for our simplified events, let's, you know, speak to a need that women have, you know, and which is financial independence is very important. I feel like it is very important for me, women to have money. So you are in the right place this evening. You are spending your evening correctly, trust me. And by the end of today's session, I'm sure that you'll have learned a lot and you will live with more um, clarity on how to, you know, earn money, how to save money, how to multiply money as a woman. So um, we're delighted to have you here. And once our speakers join, I would um, introduce them and then they'll take um, their sessions. But before then, can we just hear from you? Why, you know, why are you here? What's one major thing that you'd like to learn from today's Simplified? Just leave it in the chat box. As a woman, what's one major thing that you're prob probably going through right now that you want to learn about, you know, making your money, multiplying your money, and just being financially independent as a woman? I'm waiting to see your comments. Okay, I can see another person from Bini. Welcome. Okay, so Miriam says, I want to learn how to make the right investments. Awesome. Do we have any other person? You will be able to learn that today, so that's good. You are spending your time correctly. Same with Miriam. That's good. Before, you know, some people used to make it seem like women should not invest, but obviously that narrative is changing. And now we have one of the speakers here. Um, just a moment, everyone. I would introduce her shortly and then she will take um, a session and just you know walk us through how to start making this money, how to multiply our money, all of that, and be financially independent as women. So I see other people saying, I want to learn how to make more money moves. I love that. Financial independence, investment. I want to learn how to properly multiply my money. Okay, that's great. So I'm sure that, you know, from PC Timmy's session and from Temitope um, Buhari's session, Busari's session, apologies, you'll be able to learn, you know, a lot of these things. So let me just go ahead and introduce PC Timmy. She'll take a session. And then if you have questions, please drop it to the chat box so that you don't forget. As she's speaking, if you have questions, just drop it in the chat box. So PC Timmy is a digital marketing manager. Um, she's a growth marketer and a growth mentor at Seedstars. Her dedication to her work really is so inspiring. And this evening, we'll be learning a lot from her. She's also um, an all-round creative and someone that I have personally been stalking for a while. So get ready with your notes and get ready to learn from PC Timmy. PC Timmy, you can have the floor now. Hi. Hi, Mubolaji. Can you hear me very well? Yes, we can. Oh, sorry. My head is already please. Hi, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Kari Wise, for having me. So if I'm correct, I have just about 15 minutes to share. And I'm mostly going to talk from my experiences. Um, hi, I can see a lot of comments here. So I'm going to try to get to this question. OK, so I'll just jump right into it. Most, most of what I'm going to share is basically things for principles that I live by financially. I don't have all the money in the world yet, <laughs> um, but I have, I've been able to obscure and upgrade and just um, live on my own terms and afford the things I want to afford, fix up a lot of lessons along the way. 
and it's from those lessons that I'll be sharing today. Now, just to jump right in, right? The very first tip I have about financial independence is you need to be able to acquire skills to be able to make your own money, right? If you want to be a financially independent woman or, or even man, the very first thing you want to think about is how do I make my own money? What value can I give to be able to own my own money, to be able to build my own asset, right? And I see money as a mix of exchange. I have said this, you know, use this definition for money for as long as I can remember. That money is a means of exchange, meaning that when you give something, you get money. When you give value, people would pay you for that value you give, and they will pay you in cash, right? Or pay you in assets. So when you want to think, when you're thinking financial independence, the first thing you think about is how can I give value? How can I position myself in a place of value, right? Five years ago, I was broke. Spent five thousand naira was my first salary, and it felt like a lot and lot of money at that time. A uh, couple of years down the line, I can't even think of 25k as a lot of money. And the only reason is because I've been able to grow myself and grow my skills to the point where I am giving even more value now than I was then, right? And you can give value in different ways. You can decide that, hey, you know what? I want to do a career and I want to get a full-time job that can pay me. And that is good. Full-time job is good because you get a BBT, right? You know that at the end of every month, you get a certain amount, and if you do well, you can get promoted or you can upskill to get another pay. So you can, you, can, you, can, you can give value by saying, hey, you know what, I want to help you this company as, as a customer success person or a digital marketing person or as an admin person. Now, another way to give value is say, hey, I want to be my own boss. I want to run my own business. And you can buy and sell anything. You can sell anything. You can sell the your knowledge right you can convert that into products you can consult for people you can sell products right you can buy something from your market and sell to somebody in the entire island and just add 500 naira. you can sell services you can sell you can sell anything right you can also decide to build products or you can even build a tech startup there are different ways to go as an entrepreneur but the idea is that you have something or you have a solution or a service or a product that can fit the need of the market that you're selling to and that's value right um, and then you can also say you know what i want to do a mix of both i want to build a career and get a full-time job but i also want to be an entrepreneur and that's where most post uh, means of income comes into play whichever way that you decide to play around those start from the most important thing is to position yourself in a place of value positioning means that you are very clear about the value that you have to offer you are very clear about what you can do for people about what you can give to people to make their lives, their businesses easier, grow faster, um, make more money, be very clear about the value, very clear about your niche. And there are different ways, right? Well, especially in the tech ecosystem, we know that one of the best ways to run um, of skill and any effort to make more money right now is by learning certain critical skills that is not just culturally or locally relevant, but it's also relevant internationally, right? So you can learn tech skills, you can learn design, you can learn co um, how to code, you can be a digital marketer, you can be a UX researcher. There are different tech skills. You can be a data analyst, a data scientist. There are different, even a content marketer. There are different tech skills or skills that you can learn that can be applied in tech companies that will position you not just to get jobs within the local context, which is like Lagos or Nigeria, but also you position you to be able to get jobs globally, right? It could be remote jobs that you're earning in USD here, or it could be jobs that can export you and actually locate you to another place, right? But always think about it. What value do I want to give? What skill do I want to learn? And how do I position myself? And positioning is not just being clear. Positioning is also being visible, right? The people who make a lot of, the people who, are, who get a lot of opportunities and get these opportunities fast are people who are known. If you work in a company and you are vocal or you are known as well as you are competent in the job, people would actually refer to you faster than they refer to other people that are not known or that are very silent or just like being behind the scenes. If you are very vocal or you have social media presence, people will find it a lot easier to refer to you because they know who you are and what you do. So positioning is being clear about what, you, what value you have to offer, what skills you have, and learning those skills, but also visibility. Visibility brings more opportunities faster, right? It doesn't mean that if you're not visible, you won't get opportunities, but visibility is faster route, right? And visibility means just let people know what you do, let people um know what you can do let them know about your skills talk about building public um growing public talk about the work that you're doing in your company talk about the 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 courses that you're taking talk about the 
lectures you're attending. Talk about how you're skewing yourself. Talk about the mistakes you're making at work and how you're learning from those things. Talk, share things about how your money that give you compliments today. Make sure you have a good LinkedIn presence. You know, start a YouTube channel like me, for instance. And we'll just make sure that you are positioning yourself as much as you are being clear about the skill, the value, and being competent there. And visibility is really important in just financial independence and positioning because the more people see you, the more they can give opportunities. My last three jobs, three great opportunities came not just because I was good on paper or just came because I was my resume was good, but it also came because I was visible and I could go to my YouTube channel and watch videos of me to, to teach marketing or see my book and say, oh, this person understands content, right? And so I've been in interviews where the employer says, I watched your video on YouTube and I thought it was really brilliant. And that gives me an edge in that interview process. I've got in just side gigs because of the same thing, because I'm visible. I've got in, I've, I've, I've got in emails, um, LinkedIn DMs for MDs of top companies in Nigeria and across Nigeria who know about me and are comfortable sending me a message because I'm visible. So have the skill, two things I've said so far is be very clear about the value you have to offer because value is a mix of, value gives you money because money is a mix of exchange and value means be very clear about the, what you have to give, about the, the skill sets that you have or about the service or product you have to offer as a business person and then be visible. My brother is saying that a lot of women are shy about being visible and that's true, right? The visibility takes courage, but it also takes practice, right? Uh, I'm still a very shy and introverted person, but because I have tried to just teach and talk and make videos and do public speaking, I've become better at just showing up publicly and just better at sharing my story. And because I'm also seeing the results, but it takes practice, right? You're not going to, you know, become a social savvy person immediately, right? But with practice, you will get there. It, so keep that in mind, right? That number one, visibility takes practice. It also takes courage. It also, you should also do it, not just because you think you're shy, but also because you know the end goal. So I, I leave this comment called Women Will. And one of the, one of the key, um, key pillars of Women Will is I Am Remarkable, where we hold I Am Remarkable workshops to just teach women how to become more visible and more vocal. And when I started training at Remarkable, I did dive into a lot of research. And I found out that most, a lot of, a lot of, if you, if you, if you take a cross section of like, say, 100 people, right? And say, uh, 100 people, 100 men, 100 women, you'll find that men, 80% of them, 90% of them are vocal. They are audacious. They are showing up. They are applying for jobs that they are not qualified for. Meanwhile, women will wait until they are like, 1.5 times more qualified before they apply for the same job. But it's not only, it's not people that are qualified that get jobs, people that actually apply for those jobs. So when you begin to see stats like this, that men tend to go, get ahead faster and more because they're audacious, they just talk, they show up, then that should motivate you to say, hey, if I also want to fast track my career or fast track my business, then I need to sort of like train myself, get courageous and get over the shyness and begin to talk and share my story. And because it takes practice, the more you do it, the better you get, the more comfortable you do it. So yes, you are shy. Yes, yes you feel like you should have great art or talk about work that people will actually start, you know, saying, oh my God, but it's not as good as or you feel like you're not too good enough, or you feel like there's too much scrutiny, but still do it anyway, because the more you do it, the more you find, and the, the better you get at just not about what people think, but the next year's actually. So be scared, right? It's okay, it's okay to feel like you're not good enough. It's okay to, I'm not used to being visible. Beat, but go ahead and do it way, right? Share, one, just, Give yourself it to just talk about the work you do. And then next month, talk about it. And the way you, the more you do it, I see opportunities, the better I get. I started making videos on YouTube. I think that two years down the line, I was teaching you. But I remember like into making videos that the end of one real estate firm, let's say Mongolia, Bionia, literally them and say, come and train people. And I'm like, oh, I can actually get job opportunities by just teaching on YouTube whether I don't have all the people in the world or not, so I'm going to keep doing it.
you may start saying the, 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 the benefits you keep at it. But yes, too scared, too shy, but then like, don't let that stop you at all, right? Because hey, the men that are not even scared and are courageous enough to be ambitious enough to, and ambitious enough to apply for things, to be visible, they are reaping all the benefits. So why can't you, right? Okay, guys, so let, me, let me move on. So I said a couple of things right now with you. The first thing is, if you want to be financially independent, have your own money. To have your own money, you have you need to do two key things. Identify the value you have to give in career or a business and be visible, right? Visibility gives you more opportunity. Opportunities give you money. Now, let's say you have you found a job or you found the business that you want to run or the products that you want to sell or the service you want to sell or the side gig that you want to do, right? Um, the next thing is to sort of like keep at it, but then to start learning how to manage your money, right? So how do you manage money? There are, there, are, there are many ways. And I'm just going to give my personal experience. This might not work for everybody. And different people might have different ways of managing money that work for them. But this has helped, right? So the very first thing is I decide, I've decided, I decide, I decide at, at the beginning of or at the end of every month how much I'm going to spend for that month, right? So budgeting is important to me. And I'm trying to stick to the habit to say, hey, no matter how much money I make right now, because I care a lot about stability, I think that's one of my that's one of my biggest values, stability. Like I'm not just thinking about, oh, I have money to do everything I want to do now. I'm thinking that no matter what happens in another three months, if I save this amount of money or invest this amount of money, I know that I can still maintain my lifestyle for another six months or so. So that's stability so that I think about. And I said, hey, what can help me always feel like I have stability in my life and finances is by budgeting saving and then investments. These are three different things. So the first thing is, hey, how much do I want to spend in a month, right? And I'm not, I'm not as disciplined as some people that have spreadsheets and they write out every single amount of money that they spend or every single amount of money that they want to spend. I just have it at the back of my head that, hey, this month, so my bills, my bills is 10,000 naira, right? Um, flexing money is 5,000 naira. Data money is 20K. I just have all of that and I know exactly what each of them is going to. If I end up flexing five times in a month, I don't care how much each of those flex for, but I know that it doesn't exceed that amount. So budget helps, right? The next thing is I always save first before I start spending. The minute I decide that, oh, okay, say for instance, I earn 100K, I'm going to use 50K for bills and everything, and I'm going to save 50% of that. I don't wait until I start spending to save. I always save first. I would literally, as money is entering my account, I will usually take the money out that I'm going to save and put it where I want it to be. And what helps me to really save well is that I have numerous accounts. I have a, most of the financial apps that you can think about, CDVS, HarryWise, um, Zenit Bank, Access Bank, Huda, Goldman. I have lots of accounts. And I have different kind of, or different limits in accessing these accounts. I have only one ATM card and for one bank, and I have another bank that allows me to use token. And I almost never tie that hard token out because I don't want to be able to so it feel like, oh, continuously spend that money. So whenever I want to do something, the money is in my card. Every other day, it can be like 2,000 and is in that card and that's fine. And there's another bank or another bank. So it's just there. I limit my access to it so that, because again, I'm trying to work with budget. I don't, I don't overspend because if my money is in different places that I can touch based on the fact that I don't want to touch it, but also because I have limited my access to it in terms of, oh, I have to open up, I have to do this token, I have to do this, I have to go to the bank to withdraw. It just makes my, my life harder. And the harder my life is in accessing money, the easier it is for me to save. So yeah, so save first, um, find different means to help you make sure that you stick to your savings plan. For me, it's multiple bank accounts that are multiple um, fintech accounts that I don't have access to. And then also decide, so yeah, that's, that's this thing. And then another thing is always have your major thing for before you do anything, before you spend, before you gift, before you invest, always have your emergency fund. I, when, I, when I started thinking about instability and financial independence, my first goal was to save my emergency fund. That was my very first goal. So I said, hey, this is how much I'm currently spending a month. I want to be able to save this for three to six months, right? My goal was six months. It doesn't have to be that. And so when I click my emergency fund goal, I'm like, good. I stored it somewhere else and the money is still there, randomly just there. And then I start saving to invest and doing all that thing. So when you start saving, think about your emergency fund. Emergency fund is simply the amount of money you need to have at every given time. Right? That you need to have that can help you live your life or your pay your essential bills, food, 
rent, light bill for at least three months or at least two to six months. In that time, even if you need a job, you can still survive, right? So yeah, save first for your emergency fund. And then you can then begin to save, to spend on yourself. You can begin to save to invest. Now, my own principle for investment is one, understand what you're investing. Two, always invest based on your own level of risk appetite. So I explain. Now, there are lots of investment with things, right? You can just do ultra funds. You can do cryptocurrency. You can do rise vest and do dollar investment. You can do KIY stash. You can, yes, there's so many things, that you, so many ways that you can invest, right? You can do stocks. You can do um, ag um, agriculture, invest in agriculture. There's so many ways. Now, there's a tendency, especially when you're on the internet, when you're on Twitter, to get carried away with everybody says, oh, this is what is making their money now. They are doing stocks. So yeah, let me carry my money into stocks. Ah, Bitcoin is rising. Let me carry my money into Bitcoin. Those things are great because, I mean, you can easily get lucky and jump on it fast. But also, before you put your money, one, have knowledge, and two, know your risk appetite. There are different levels of investments that have different risk levels. Some of them, like ultra funds, are good, right? Low returns, but you know that your funds are pretty safe. Some of them, like cryptocurrency is very volatile, very high risk, very high returns. Before you put your money in crypto, understand what crypto is, understand what Bitcoin is, understand how the market works, how it has increased over the years. Read, ask questions, attend webinars for people that are doing crypto investments, right? Send their customer service message, go and read their FAQs, understand it, and so that's knowledge. And then when you're ready to invest, only invest the amount of money they are willing to lose, right? So if 50k is all the money you have right now. Do you want to spend all that 50k on crypto? Do you want to spend all that 50k on angel funding, on angel investment? No, because then what happens to your emergency for what happens if you lose a job tomorrow, right? So only invest the level of your risk appetite. Have knowledge about the different things you can invest in. Have knowledge about <laughs> this would be like have knowledge about um, the different things that you can invest in. Have knowledge about you know the the whether it's risky the returns, you know, gather knowledge as much as you can. And then when you are putting money into it, make sure that that's not all the money or that's the money that you're willing to lose, right? And then another thing is, I, I believe that in terms of making wealth, right, investment is a long-term strategy, right? So some people make money by, you know, doing trade and doing forex, but I don't, so I can't speak for it. But how I've always viewed investment is a long-term investment strategy that if I put a certain amount of money now, in five to 10 years, I can 10X, 20X, 100X that amount of money. And that gives me long-term stability, not stability now, but stability in five or 10 years when I want to reduce the amount of work that I have, or I just don't want to work anymore, I want to retire. I want the work that I'm doing now to be able to pay forward to that time. So when I think about investment, that's what I think about, right? How do I, what do I need to invest in that can give me long-term returns, not just high returns, for long-term returns. And whenever I get a dividend from the investment, it's not, it's not, you should not just get dividends and say, hey, I have dividends, but now I just want to spend and I want to borrow. It's, hey, how can I even reinvest this seed or this dividend so that I can sort of like multiply? I believe in the law of compounding a lot in life and in finance. That just the same way habit compounds is the same way is that investment and money compounds. If I start doing something today, and I keep at it, I will get the results of that new habit or that new skill or that new knowledge in three months, in six months, in one year, because every day it increases. But it's the same thing, if I invest money now, then I can increase the amount of money that I have in 10 years, because every other day, there's returns on that money. So I think about compounding law, and I think about long-term all the time when I think about investment and when I think about money generally. And there's something else that helps it. I also think that, okay, so also because I, I, I'm playing the long-term game, I'm not very, again, my risk capital is also very low. So I'm not looking for like very quick returns. I'm saying, hey, keep this for the next five years, for the next 10 years. I don't want to touch this money. I'm really, I'm willing to lock it down for a long time. And so what I then, how I've played my game in the last couple of years, you see my income, my income. Saving, it's not by using the instrument or the dividend for my investment income, it's by upsetting and getting better jobs or just commanding higher pay, right? And I think this is very important for women because when I think of financial independence, savings, and you must have heard that a lot, savings 
it's not going to give you financial independence. Your emergency fund is not financial independence. If that one is literally emergency, something is happening, my life is crumbling, but I still have money to survive. Investments can give you financial independence if you play the long-term game, right? But what if I need to, but for me to even have a good amount of money to invest because your investment returns is directly proportional to the amount of money you have to invest. So people who are investing $1 million every quarter, their returns cannot be compared to somebody who is investing $1,000 every quarter or somebody who is investing $100,000 every month, right? So the more money you have to invest, even the more returns you can get. So how do you then make that more money now so you even have enough funds to pay long-term gain or to even get higher, way higher returns even for the short-term gain that you're paying, right? That means increasing your income. And that goes back to the first thing I said, that money is an exchange of value. Give money. You're starting by learning how to get value, how to give value so you can get money. But even when you start that, so even multiply your income, you need to keep giving value. I need to start upskilling. And how you can do that is, one, multiple streams of income. Two, negotiate every offer. Three, it's okay to go where the money is for a time limit. Now, break it down. Well, multiple streams of income means just the fact that I want to build a career in nine to five doesn't mean that I can't have side gigs that takes weekends off me just so that I can, you know, um, make some money there. Doesn't mean that I can't do a random training here, a random webinar here, a consulting gig here. I can't start selling products. I, I can sell hair. I can sell clothes. I can sell small shops. I can write a book and sell the book and make money from it. There are different ways, there are different things that you can give, even when you have a nine to five, that can still make you money, right? And some of those things can be passive income, active income, but you want to make sure that you have money from different places. I can't remember the last time I've, I, I, I've had only one stream of income. Uh, I've always had different ways to get money at the end of every month. And sometimes it's costly, other times it's just passive income that just comes because I've done work for a period of time. So think multiple streams of income. Even as a business person, um, aside your main business, are there other side gigs you can do? Are there other investments you can do? Are there other ways you can get passive income? Are there other investments that you can make that can give you monthly dividends that is just a passive income? But always think multiple streams of income. And then two, negotiate every offer, right? Negotiate every offer. If you are getting a job, don't be afraid to negotiate. If And, and there's so many things you can negotiate. I'll give you guys a card, for example. I was having a conversation on DM, and I'm going to run up in like two minutes. I was having a conversation in DM with um, someone on Twitter the other day, and she's like, she wants to move job because she's feeling undervalued at her job. And also, they are not willing to increase her salary. And her, she has kind of like grown the amount of money she's earning right now. But then she's like, hey, these people are, paying, are willing to pay me higher. However, the job title is lower than what my current job title is. And I'm like, see, when you're moving jobs, it's not just money you negotiate. You can negotiate other things, including job title. You can negotiate for a better job title as long as you're not taking somebody else's job title. You can negotiate for perks, right? My friend was telling me that when she got her job, she negotiated for two days remote work just so that she can work from home since they can increase her salary. So always think about how what you can leverage and what matters to you in a job and negotiate from that. And when you're negotiating, always negotiate from a place of strength. Be willing to lose something just to negotiate. The truth is for every offer, there's at least another five percent higher than that company or that business can actually go for. And in negotiating comes that means that don't be afraid to ask for your worth. I, I decided that this year I was going to limit very much the amount of training or speaking I did, except they pay me a certain amount of money. And I, I get at least two emails every week saying, please come and speak here. And I have consistently either given them a huge bill or just said no. And even when I lose it, I'm like, I'm willing to lose it because it's not, I'm worth more than that. And if that can't pay me, it's fine. But eventually you'll find people that can actually pay you your worth. But you have to keep asking for it. If you don't ask, people will pay you anything that they feel like you're worth. So you have to go and say, hey, in my life right now, with this level of work that I've done, with this level of experience I've gotten, this is what I'm, I'm worth. And this is how to ask for it, right? The more you ask, the more independent you become, the more power is in your hands, and the more you command at the end of the day, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to go where the money is, right? So yes, negotiate. And then last thing I said was, don't be afraid to go where the money is. If you are currently in a job and you're not paying you well and you're not going to increase your salary, and there's another offer that's willing to pay you better and it's a good company, it's something you're passionate about, it's okay to move, it's okay to get it. People say that it's far easier to double your 
your income by 100% when you move jobs than when you stay in place. So it's okay. It's also okay to say, hey, at a point in my life, for the next two years, I want to work for money, right? And let me get myself to a certain point, have enough money saved up or invested, and then go and do something else that I love and I want to invest, right? It's your life, but also be very clear about your goals and how you want to play the game. I have to round up now I'm from Obalaji, you guys in the other stage. But I'll just try to reiterate some of the things that I said so that you guys can remember. One is money is a mix of exchange. Fundamentally, if you give value and you're clear about the value and the people that you're serving, you will likely get money back as for that. And when you're getting money back, whether it's a job or it's a business, always negotiate from a place of strength. Ask for the things you want, ask for what you're worth. Even if it's not in cash, it can be in just other perks, other benefits, it can be in titles. But always, always negotiate. Always ask for even more than you're giving. Even if they say no, but always ask. Two, be visible, right? Visibility gives you opportunities to move forward faster, right? So you might be shy. You might not be used to it yet, but visibility gets better with practice and with courage. You tell yourself, I want, to be, I'm, I, I'm, I want to reach a certain goal, and if visibility will help me get it, then I'm going to try. Again, men are far more ambitious than we are. And they keep getting going forward. So we can decide to also go forward and be as ambitious as them so we can compete better for these opportunities. If you see something that you're not 100% qualified for, apply anyway. Don't wait until you're 105% qualified for it before you apply for stuff. Go for it. Like people get jobs every day that they're not qualified for just because they allow themselves to try. Always, when you start saving, start with having an emergency fund, first of all. That's like the first thing. And then, save first, work with your budget, invest based on knowledge and based on your risk appetite, right? And always make sure that you're playing the long-term game when it comes to investment. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, Peace. This was really enlightening. So, Tim Talkback, is the founder of Money Savvy with Temi, a financial literacy platform. She was most recently vice president and treasurer at Chapel Hill Denham. Today we'll be learning how women can become financially independent from her. So she's a very, when it comes to like the money space, she has worked in investment bank, um, and all of that, right? She knows she, she knows a lot about this space, so I'm sure that we will learn a lot from her. So, Tammy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mobalaji. That was um, a good introduction. Thank you. And um, well done to the first speaker. She did quite a bit of justice. I, I don't even feel like we need my session after that, <laughs> but I should. Anyway, so hi everyone. Um, when I got the invitation for today's session, I was very excited because when I hear financial independence and hear money and hear women, you know, my antenna just peaks. So I started Money Savvy with Timmy out of the passion to essentially educate, inspire, and equip people, particularly women and the youth, because these are typically the disadvantaged groups in the society. Um, given the most recent recession, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic-induced recession that we've seen affecting global markets, it, it has actually been labeled a she session in some parts of North America saying that, look, women are more disproportionately um, affected, women being the primary caregivers in the home, they can't go back to work because there's you know, lockdowns and schools have been shut down and all of that. So it's very important to me that women understand the power that we have when we are financially um, literate. So talking about financial literacy and independence and education, essentially what I find in my very many years of experience is that the more people understand it, the more people understand how to make money, how to be independent, the more they want to partake. And thankfully, we're having so many fintech organizations like CalriWise, you know, in the market today, democratizing access, you know, to all of these things. Developing a healthy mindset and relationship with money actually goes a very long way. And I'm going to start my presentation talking about why you act the way that you do, the mindset that you have um, towards money. 
when you're financially literate, you know, you'll be able to understand the concept of investing. Um, as Peace noted, um, you know, investing is one of the ways that you can build transgenerational wealth. That's one of the ways that you can double your money legally, <laughs> not all the money doublers, you know, and all those funds schemes around. Investing is very critical um, in this personal finance, this um, financial in, uh, independence conversation. You know, you also know when you're financially literate, you'll be able to seek out relevant information, financial information before making decisions. Nobody's asking you to go get um, an ACCA degree or a CFA degree or anything like that. But if you invest in yourself, by yourself, you're able to look at investment opportunities and know that, nope, what you're promising me does not make any sense. You're able to understand the kind of stocks that you want to invest in. You know, you'll be able to set financial goals that are in line with what you want to achieve. That's why we have goals and we have financial plans and strategies to be able to achieve um, those goals. In Nigeria, more specifically, right? Women are even more disproportionately affected by economic hard, uh, hardships because, I mean, the men on the, on the call would not agree, but patriarchy is essentially the ruling system, right? And the stats are not looking good for, I mean, with formal education, with financial literacy, we find that today, and your financial literacy, as Peace also rightly said, you know, when you're able to um, give value, when you're, when you're educated and you're able to give value, you know, it improves your earning capacity and you're very empowered. But we find that today there are twice as many women below men, you know, twice as many women as men below the poverty line. Do you see? So it's very important that women need to understand money. It's a powerful thing. You need to learn about budgeting. You need to learn how to plan, how to save, how to invest, you know, the entire spectrum of personal finance. And there's this myth that goes around where people say, oh, you know, um, wealth management and money management is for the rich. It's for people like Adenoga and Dangote. That is not the truth. You don't suddenly become rich. You don't suddenly become rich and now start to know how to manage money. You, you start to manage money and then become rich because of your money habits, right? So you need to understand your risk profile. Crypto is not good for everybody. Um, it depends on your age. It depends on the risk tolerance that you have. Equity might not be good for everybody. It depends on you know, what you're trying to achieve, your financial goal. So if you invest in yourself, you're able to identify those things. And remember, a financially independent woman is a powerful one. She's limitless. She doesn't wait for anybody to be able to do things. You're able to pursue your goals, you know, and achieve them. So very quickly, I have some slides that I want to share. Um, I'll try to keep it within the 15 minute mark, but there you go. Mubalaji, do let me know when you are seeing my slides. I can see them. You can see, excellent. So, okay, so we'll take you from here. I'm not gonna take everything, but you know, very quickly, let's start with why you act the way that you do. So there's a, a professor of psychology called Dr. Brattons, who decided to explain why we act, the kind of money habits that we have. So he came, he did a research, you know, interviewing thousands of people. And then he was able to look through the results that he got and did this categorization into four buckets. So you find that every individual on this earth belongs to one, at least one of these buckets. Personally, I find that I belong to, I think about two, but as we talk about them, um, you'll be able to identify yourself and hopefully I can incite you to start to be self-aware and start to act differently. So let's talk about money scripts, right? Your money scripts, um, they are like the conscious or unconscious beliefs that you have about money. And these kind of just shape your financial habits and your outcomes. So depending on the kind of childhood that you had, depending on what people have been saying around you, your environment, what you're exposed to, you know, you start to inculcate these habits. Mostly it's unconscious. You don't even know that that's what you do, but that's what you do. So let's start with the first one, money vigilance, right? When people have this money script, they're very anxious about their financial future. They're just like, you know what? Maybe because growing up, you know, maybe their, their dad lost his job or maybe they lost their parent and then things change in the family. They just know that, you know, when there's no money, right? Your life 
you might not be able to achieve or attain what you want in life. And so they're very anxious. Every time, you know, there's talk about money, every time their salary comes in, they're just, they're just so anxious. They're like, you know what? I just need to save. I don't even want to invest, you know? I'm so scared. They're very risk averse. They don't want to lose money. They just want to save. And they're very concerned about their finances and usually very discreet. You might say to me, well, well they get to save. That might be a good thing. We'll talk about that next, later. So money avoidance, the people that exhibit these traits, you know, they just kind of think that money is bad. Look, money is a bad thing. Wealthy people are either corrupt or greedy. Growing up in Nigeria, I heard this a lot. Like, I just hear people saying around me, like, look, if you see anybody that is so wealthy, who has a lot of money, he must have done fraud, or he must have done 419 or something. And that is a very warped mentality because somehow you start to believe it. Somehow you don't want to be driven because you don't want to be seen as, oh, I have this thirst for money and it's a bad thing. They always believe that they don't deserve to have money, but that's a wrong mentality. Money is actually a good thing. Money is not a bad thing, right? It's good to have money. It's good to be able to, you know, pursue all your dreams and aspirations and not have any limits in wanting to live the life that you want, right? Some people exhibit money worship. Money worship here, the guys just think that, look, money equals happiness and you cannot have enough. So they're constantly running after money. The pursuit of money never satisfies them. That's not a good thing. Money is important, but it's not the biggest thing in this life. And you shouldn't um, chase money at the detriment of all the relationships, right? Finally, money status. These guys, they are the fake it, so you make it gang. You know, they just, they equate their self-worth to their net worth. They just think, you know what? Let me just look like I have money. The money will come. They prioritize outward um, display of wealth. And so what does this make you do? How does it impact your life? And what are the outcomes financially that you're seeing? The money vigilance guys, excessive anxiety over money. They're very stingy. They make money decisions based on fear. Like when it's time to make money, their heart just starts to beat and you know they can't focus, they can't calm down, they can't think critically to make the best decision. It's not a good thing. They're very risk averse. They just focus on capital preservation. Like, let me just put this money under my pillow. I don't want to lose it. I don't want to invest. I don't want to do anything that might make me lose money, right? The money avoidance guys, these guys do not plan their finances. You know, they're compulsive buyers. They're like, look, it's not a good thing to have money anyway. I mean, this money in my purse, what if I didn't have it? What if I lost it tomorrow? Let me just spend it, you know? That's not a good thing. They think budgeting and investing is, uh, investments like is too complicated. The guys on the money worship side, these guys tend to overspend. Like they just look for shortcuts to making money. They just they hear that oh this investment is one hundred percent. They just put money in without thinking because they just want to make money, right? And then the money status guys, they're constantly in debt. You know, they pretend to be richer than they are. They tend to overspend and essentially just do not have a plan for their life. They just want to look good. You know, these are money scripts. So can I see with a show of hands, if you're starting to identify where you are, maybe one or two, trust me, if you sit down and think about it, at least one of these is like your default, you know? And so how do you now develop a healthy, money mindset, the mindset to know that money is a good thing, to know that, look, I can control money. Money does not control me. To know that, look, I have dreams and aspirations and I can work very hard. I have the capacity to deliver value and make money and live the kind of life that I want. So the way forward, right, you need to make a conscious decision to build and maintain a healthy money mindset. You have to use positive affirmations, like I, like I started doing a few seconds ago. You know, I'm, I'm fantastic. You know, I'm smart. I can do well at work. I can get any job that I like. I can ask for this salary and get paid. I can learn about financial literacy and actually know what to do with my money, where and when to invest. And you need to take control of your personal finance. So I'm glad you guys are here. For the mere fact that you know you saw the stain and you clicked on the link to register, it's you taking control of your personal because you want to learn more, right? So first, you need to set achievable goals, right? No anxiety when it comes to your money situation. Don't be anxious, depending on what level you are. If you think you're broke, if you think you're not doing really well financially, it's okay. You can start from whatever level, right? Just know that there's some basic things you need to start working on. What is my budget? 
you can't spend everything that comes in monthly. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Emergency savings, as Peace talked about, essentially the runway. Say, look, if I lost my job today, how much do I need to have saved such that I don't have to go broke or start sleeping on the street till I get the next job? Some people try to do three months, some do six months, some do 12 months of their monthly salary. Just have something somewhere something you can fall back on in the event of another lockdown, a pandemic, God forbid, right? And that kind of emergency savings, that is not money that you put in the equity market, right? It's money that is for emergencies. So you need to keep it liquid and keep it accessible, right? And then we'll talk about investment and retirement planning. You know, the change has to be gradual. If you do like two sudden changes, you'll be confused and disorientated and you'll be like, okay, what am I doing? You know, you need to calm down and start to, work on it, right? Achieve your goals in smaller and easier bits to build more confidence, um, enhance your knowledge. You need to take financial education very seriously, right? So that you can make informed um, decisions, invest in yourself, know your triggers. Where is that online um, store that you know that once I go there, I must buy something, whether I need it or not, you need to start managing that and then be accountable, join a community you know, of like-minded people where you can talk about money. So very quickly, let me talk about one thing that I call my personal finance culture, which is essentially the four C's of financial success. So as a woman, as a man, as a youth or an older person, what are those things that I need to do to achieve financial independence. So I call them my four C's. First, you must be creative. Creative in finding ways to earn more. And Peace did a good job talking about that in terms of what kind of value can you give? What is that thing that you do so well, you know, that you can potentially monetize? This is not the time to sit down and say, okay, I have just one income. That's not how to be financial, financially independent. Because what if something happens to that income? What if you lose your job? Right. If you were climbing, if you're on the second step to being financially independent, then overnight you could just go to ground zero. Right. And there's no shame in this game. Right. I'm a CFA charter holder. I've worked in the biggest investment bank in Nigeria. I've, you know, worked in the biggest banks. But I used to sell hair. I used to sell human hair in this market. I've sold bags. Do you see? So there's no shame. Like you need to understand that, look, on this personal finance journey, what you get, the income that comes in, is what determines the rest of the conversation. What comes in is what determines how much you can spend. That's it's even money has to come in first before we start talking about budgeting, right? So the amount that comes in is what determines, okay, how much can I spend out of it? How much can I, you know, help my parents with? How much can I save? How much can I invest? How much can I use to flex? Do you see? So if you have just one income stream coming in. That doesn't help you. How, how many years is it going to take you to get to that financial independence? So think about it. Do you know how to cook really well? Many people are like, I'm tired of eating my own food. Honestly, like being at home in the lockdown and all of that. I'm like, if I could buy something else, you know, what can you do? Can you learn digital courses? Can you do stuff online? What can you start to do to exchange for money? Right? You need to find creative ways to earn more money, more than one source of income. It's one of the ways to get there very quickly. Second C is conservative. You need to be conservative with your spending. You cannot spend everything that you earn. You just cannot. You need to consistently spend less than you earn. If you're spending more than you earn, your, your case is a different one. It's a different conversation. It's not this one, right? You can't even spend everything that comes in because you don't have any leverage. You don't have any you know, safety net in case something happens, right? You need to be consistent with saving and investing. This is the magic. This is the magic. This is how you grow 1 million naira to 200 million naira over time, consistently, sustainably, right? And savers don't get rich. It's not just about saving the money. With inflation, with devaluation, you don't get much, right? You need to have your emergency savings, which is that one, that you have for emergencies, 
when you have that, then you think about investing and then you start to think, what am I investing? What are my goals? If I'm trying to invest money to go for my master's in two years, then I know I can't put that money in crypto. If I'm trying to invest money that I'm going to need in five years time, then I know, yes, I can play in the equity market. But even if I want to buy stocks, right, what kind of stocks should I buy? Should I look for dividend paying stocks? Should I look for stocks in tech? What am I doing? And these are stuff that you can pick up easily only if you pay attention. And you need to be careful with financial advisory. That's the fourth C. Not every investment advice is good for you. People come at you with different, oh, you can put in this agri-tech, you can put 200K here. In two weeks, you get 400K. What is the underlying? Those are the kind of questions you need to ask. So the smartest way to invest, remember, I said that this is the magic. This is how you can start to grow your money. And there's no excuse of, oh, I don't have money today. I have only 5,000 naira. Kari Wise is there to even help you invest in euro bonds, to help you protect, you know, against the valuation with as little as how much? Do you see? So the smartest way to invest is first to subscribe to financial education platforms for money tips. Follow people like me online, you know, follow firms and institutions like Kauri Wise, learn about investing. You know, you need to have a, you know, follow the beginner investor checklist. I don't know how much time I have. I might talk about that or not. Build your budget to track your spending. What is your margin? Your margin is the amount that's different between what comes in and what goes out. Remember, I talked about the starting point as what comes in. So what comes in determines how big your margin is. And your margin, that's the magic number that can change your life. So what are you doing with that margin? Where are you investing it, right? With budgeting, it's also good to build an occasional guilt-free treat so that, you know, it doesn't feel like, oh, it's so stringent. Budgeting shouldn't stress you out. It's not something that has to be so stringent that, oh my God, it's so hard. If you're struggling with it, it's probably because it's not reasonable for you. So get a working budget. If you want to do dirty December, right? Start saving 20K from January. If you save 20K from January by December, you have 240k to flex. You don't have to touch your investment banking. You don't have to touch your emergency funding, right? So you need to be very careful and plan. Take it seriously. Like your money conversation, your personal finance is something so serious. It's something you should take as seriously as the way you take your career or something because it determines the quality of life that you get. We all have a finite number of years we're going to work for. We're not going to work forever. At some point, we're going to stop working. And then whatever money we've saved and invested and amassed is what will determine the rest of our lives. So do we want to plus now, slay now and suffer later? You don't want that. Emergency fund, I talked about that. Create an, uh, an investment plan. And this is probably a conversation that is more than 15 minutes. But like I said before, you need to understand your risk profile to say, look, I'm not very aggressive. I just want my money to grow. And another person will tell you, I'm here for the big box. You know, I want to put 20% of my money in crypto because I know, yes, it swings widely. Yes, I know it's very um, speculative, but I have the risk tolerance for it. So you need to understand yourself, right? What time do you have? Somebody that has turned 50 cannot be playing like that with crypto and equity. He wants a more stable fixed income investment that he knows, okay, I'm about to retire. I just want something that you know, can come in every month for the rest of my life, that sort of thing. Then you need to start investing, just start. In Nigeria today with 5,000 Naira, you can open. In fact, opening a brokerage or investment account is even free. All you need is your BBC, right? But you can start to buy shares with 5,000 Naira. You can start to build an investment portfolio with as little as putting 2,000 Naira aside every month. And Calvary Wise can help you with that. You need to diversify your investment. I mean, as soon as, you know, the money starts to grow, you want to have some means of equity, some fixed income, you want to have some, if you can do real estate, a bit fine, put some in USD, some in Naira, just diversify so that if there's any, you know, shaking in any market, you're probably um, protected by having other investments and other assets, right? Avoid investment scams and Ponzi schemes. I, I tell people, just avoid it. Somebody comes to you and says, oh, in, two, in, 20, in 20 days, I'll pay you 60%. What is that person doing with that money to be able to pay you that much? Do you see? So you need to be very careful. You need to be very observant and take your money very seriously and work with an expert if necessary, right? Um, I suppose we'll just stop there. I don't know. Do we have more time? Uh, do we still have more time? 
no more time. Thanks, people. <laughs> Thank you so much for your session. That was very enlightening and I took away a lot of notes. Um, but because of time, let's just go right into the Q&A. So I think I, I saw some, someone asked for social media, your social media, I've shared the link to your LinkedIn and um, Peace um, LinkedIn as well. But do we have any questions for them? If you have any questions, please can you go ahead and ask? But let me, there were some that I took note of. Okay, so there's one, can insurance, can insurance be used as one's in emergency fund? Please, Timmy, would you like to answer that? Sure, can it, what, what do you mean? Can you use your emergency funding for insurance or is that the question? Yeah, so, so let's say maybe like having life insurance or something, can you use that as your emergency fund? No, that's a separate conversation, right? So your emergency fund is there for emergencies. So it's not for something that essentially for unplanned situations. So you lose your job, for example, how are you going to feed your children, right? So your wall caves in tomorrow, like where are you going to sleep for that first night? That sort of thing. So it's there for expenses that you didn't plan but that can shake you if you're not prepared for that it could be a grave medical um, expense something you need to pay for or something right but when you're talking about insurance and all these other planned expenses there's something you can work into your like monthly salary or just have a separate plan but emergency fund is strictly there money that you don't touch money that you don't use for shopping or anything you just keep it there for the rainy day that sort of thing I agree. Let me go back. Uh, there were some questions. So I would ask Peace this one. What portion or percentage of your income should be put away for emergency? I feel like today is just everybody's thinking, I actually don't have an emergency fund. <laughs> so Peace, how would you answer that? So I, I don't think that it's a, emergency fund is not a percentage conversation. If you're talking about savings or investments, then you can think about percentages. But here's how you calculate your emergency fund. So say, for instance, I spend 200,000 naira every month to cover my basic expenses, light bill, food, um, data, maybe even rent if I'm paying 120, my basic expense is say 200K. Now, I then have to save up at least three times that, which is 600K, that's gonna cover me for three months just in case something happens, right? And if it also helps me, this, I can also take out money from that. So think about your emergency funds like that. First of all, start by calculating how much do I need to survive, not to flex, not live a baby girl life or a baby boy life, not to travel. Just how much do you need to survive? If it's 5K, it's 10K, it's 50K, then just save up three times that. Now, when you know the amount that you need every month, and you know that you don't times that by three, but that's the amount I need to survive for three months, then you can then ask yourself, based on what you earn, what would be the best way to actually save up that money, right? So I can say, hey, if I need to save up, say 150K as my emergency fund to cover me for three months, and I currently earn 150K, right? I can then say, you know what, for the next three months, I'm going to go hard and just save one third of my salary so that after three months, I know that, ha, ah, I have an emergency fund there, and that means 50%. Otherwise, I can say, you know what, because of the other expenses that I have, investment, family, blah, 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 then I can only save 20K. So 20K times divided by 150, that counts how many times I need to create more money. But so it would depend again on how much you're earning and how fast you want to save up. When I decided I was going to save my emergency fund, I did it in like three months because I was like, see, it's an emergency. I don't know whether when an emergency will come, whether it's going to come in a year or if it's going to come in two weeks, or if it's going to come in three months. So as much as possible, I need to have that money ready now. So I went very hard, right? So that, that's how I answer the question. I don't think it's a percentage thing. It's really about how much, how fast you want to save that money and how much you need to save from your um, total earnings. All right, thank you very much, Peace. Um, because we've overshoot our time, I'll just take, let's say, one question each for the both of you again. Um, so I'm seeing this question for the second time. Someone asking if they can get the slides. Is that possible, Tammy? Sure, I can make that available. I, I can do that. 
Okay, thank you so much. So we'll share that with everyone here. I'm sure you must have registered if you are here, right? So you get it um, by email. But for peace, I would like to ask you, you know, visibility is something that I know that you do really, really well because, you know, I said I stalk you personally, right? And to be honest, like for women, it might seem like, oh, you know, this person is doing amazing and we know that we can do that, but there's just something holding a lot of us back, right? I don't know, maybe it's opinions of people or whatever, but what would you advise for someone who knows that they have a lot of value to offer right and they would want to become more visible how you know how would you advise that person to begin start start really small and tweet today or post on instagram and say hey i have 50 followers and i'm not sure you guys know what i do but in my day job i do this i do this and i work here start with that first and then figure out how what you want to talk about right the, idea of visibility is you want to also decide on how you want to come out and what kind of content you want to put out there. Say, hey, it's saying it's being strong thing to do. Um, for some people, it could be, so for me, right, I wanted, to, I wanted to share what I could do. And I decided that two ways I would do it. I would talk about, I would share pictures of trainings that I attend. Or two, I would also create content that teach people that. So the more I do that, people can then see this person is a top leader or an expertise in her space, right? For some other people, they just share about their career journey, right? Somebody that I really admire in terms of how he talks about his work is Justin, right? He's now a software developer. But I remember that before he was a software developer, he was a digital marketer. And for as long as ever, Justin just talks about his work. He's a hotel engineer and he's facing a problem. He just talks about it. Oh, I did this today. Or I, I read something about digital marketing today. And this is how I implemented it at work, right? When he starts taking courses to learn, software developer, he wasn't a developer then, he was just about to start learning how to code. And he basically took us through that journey and said, hey, I'm a digital marketing, I want to learn how to code, this is where I'm learning. And every other week, he would just be updating us. And it was interesting to follow his story, right? And now we know that, okay, this is who he is. So there's no right, oh, this is the exact kind of content that you need to create, but you have to do it. And it's just starting, decide that, hey, I want to share my career journey. Or I want to teach people or share knowledge so people can say I'm a top leader in this space. And then you start. It could be once a week uh, or, or once in two weeks and then once. But the more you do it, the more muscle you build to do it, right? I talk instinctively now on social media and it's much easier than I could five years ago when I started sharing stuff. And that's because I built the muscle be able to share content and be able to become more people and just share my story on. So it takes practice, it takes courage, it takes opening up yourself, but the more you do it, the better you get. And so also what really helps is by knowing and remembering why I'm not just doing visibility because I'll be an influencer. No, and because I know for a fact that opportunities for career growth and business growth comes out of this. I'm very clear about the goal. It's easier to pursue that because you know what you're trying to get for. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Peace. So I'm sure, you know, we must have learned from that. It might not seem easy at first, but you definitely want to learn, you know, how to be visible as a woman. I think I'll just take a last question on Forex because I find it interesting. This would be for Tammy. Um, do you trade Forex? And if you do, what platforms would you suggest for a beginner? So I love that question. Um, I love that question. And the way I would answer it is I trade Forex or I used to trade Forex, right, as my day job. So I'm a treasury professional, right? So I can trade Forex. I've been trained for it. So Forex trading is actually some people's day job. It's an, it, there's an art and a science to it. 
You don't just wake up and start to trade Forex. I like to tell people, Forex trading is not an investment, right? Forex trading is what it is, it's trading. So when you're trading, you're speculating about the value of one cur uh, currency against the other. Now, to be able to do that, what kind of training do you have? What kind of experience do you have? For people that trade Forex, you know, they can read the global market. They know that, okay, uh, from what I'm seeing, my view is that this currency is going to move and I want to position, I want to go long, I want to go short. It's a whole trading strategy. It's a whole career job. Allow me to say that at the risk of tautology, right? So if you want to do that, if you want to learn about it, that's fine. I'm not um, discouraging you, but make sure that you learn about it. You need to know what you're doing and have a plan. So I always, I, I despise people that try to just make people say, oh, Forex trading is the way to make money. Come, I'll, treat, I'll teach you how to trade Forex, right? It's not an investment. If you have a flair for it, if you want to learn it, and if you want to understand it, that way you would know the proper channels and proper, pla uh, proper platforms to use. A lot of people have been defrauded. A lot of people have lost their money to these trading scams because they don't understand what they're going in there for. So if you want to learn it as a career or something to do on the side, or as another source of income, invest in it, learn about it, like pay your tuition fees, go to school for it, and know that you know what you're doing, right? But in terms of just looking for a quick fix, or how am I going to double my money, they say Forex trading is a thing. It's not. Like you can lose millions of dollars from trading Forex, and you can also make millions. The difference between the two traders that do that is information. So you need to be sure what you're doing. All right, thank you so much. I think something else that I will add to that is, you know, Peace has said, has said it and Tammy mentioned it as well, you know, going for investments according to your risk level, right? So just because we came here and we've talked about saving, investing, doesn't mean you should just go and start a plan without, you know, taking your time to learn, to understand how, you know, things work. So if you know that you're a beginner, Forex might not be the place for you to start, right, for a beginner. So make sure that you are going according to your risk level and with that we've come to the end of this session but before you leave um i would just like to quickly share a bit about carry wise right and i love that we spoke a lot about emergency funds today right and it's something that if you go into your carry wise app right now you can start your emergency fund immediately right i have my emergency fund i don't let me lie there's a feeling see women we need to have money there's a feeling i have when i open my app and i just see that if anything happens like i would not be super stranded i would have something to at least you know hold me for a few months and that's so important. The reason why I feel like, you know, women are treated a certain way sometimes. Let me just quickly share a story. So a few weeks ago, I saw a news about someone or a couple that had been married for like 30 something years, right? The woman was married to a billionaire and then he sent her out of the house. And from the pictures, the way her clothes and everything were packed outside, I do not even want to know who was at fault in the marriage. All my thoughts was, if this man knew that this woman was financially stable, the way he would send her out would have been different, right? And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm hoping that marriages fail or all of that, but I'm just saying it is good and it feels good to have your own money. So um, if you're a beginner, you know, you're in the right place. After this meeting, I would send an email to you for you to sort of know how to begin, you know, and carry wise is super easy to use. And I'm sure that, you know, from the lessons here, all of us will go reflecting as women that I need to do better than I'm doing currently. If you only have one stream of income, you've heard today that, you know, one stream of income is not enough in a pandemic. You should get extra, right? So thank you so much, Peace. Thank you so much, Tammy, for your time. If you learned from them, can you clap in the chat box or leave thank you so much in the chat box? If not, <laughs> I always stress in at the end of every simplified. But thank you. See, they are leaving thank yous in the chat box. So thank you so much for your time. People are clapping. People are leaving thumbs up. People are leaving, you know, love hearts. So thanks, peace. We really appreciate it. And everyone, look forward to the mail after this session. All right, everyone. Have an amazing evening.
Enjoy your day and your month. Bye. Bye.